My name is Michal Steinhue and this is Noisy Intermediate Scale Podcast, a podcast where we'll have in-depth discussions about quantum computing industry, community and research. In this episode, I talked with Razia Anabestani. She is one of the few people in the quantum world who have experience working in academia, industry and government. We talked about quantum computing ecosystem, differences between various sectors and the position of Canada in the quantum world. Before we start, I wanted to give you a little bit more context on the timeline for this episode. So we first talked with Razia about the recording together in April. She joined Zapata in June and we talked two or three weeks after that. Then a lot of things happened in my life and here I am in the middle of October recording this introduction. I apologize for this break and I hope I'll be able to get into a more regular recording schedule soon. I plan to talk with some really interesting guests so if you don't want to miss that please subscribe to the podcast. Okay let's get to the show now. I hope you'll enjoy listening to this conversation. Hello, today I'm talking with Razie Anabestani. Razie got her master in physics from Sharif University of Technology in Tehran and PhD from University of Waterloo, and later has been a postdoc at Institute for Quantum Computing at Waterloo. Afterwards, she worked at Zanadu and Anion Systems, two Canadian hardware quantum computing startups. Uh, for the last couple of months, she's been advising Government of Canada about quantum strategy, and she has just recently joined Zapata, as Strategic Partnership Alliance Manager. Happy to have you here. Thank you. Thank you, Michal, for inviting me. My pleasure. First question, what are you currently working on and why do you think this is important? Okay, I joined Zapata just three weeks ago, so I don't have much experience yet to explain about what I'm doing, but I can tell you what I'm hoping to do. Sure. Uh, Zapata is a software company and they are providing quantum solutions for the frontline customers. So as you know, quantum computing is promised to revolutionize different industries and Zapata is providing platform that can integrate quantum solutions to the existing uh, pipeline of different industries. Now, me as a manager for partnership, my role is more, um, so so we have three big players in this um, chain. We have the frontline customers, which is like air industry, automobile, or different people who have a complex computational problem. We have the software providers like Zapata. And at the end of the day, these softwares and algorithms must be run on a quantum platform. And the task of me as a partnership manager is to make that connection between the hardware vendors and software company like us and trying to come up with uh, solutions that how we can early enough integrate the um, the quantum algorithm that Zapata is developing um, in the sense that it's compatible with their hardware as well. So, yeah, it, it's not just me alone. It's a team. Sure. And I would be more on the business side, but I'm collaborating with the technical team as well. Sure thing. And so one question that um, kind of comes to my mind, I would say quite often is why hardware vendors cannot build the whole software stack themselves? Well, it's not about they cannot. It's not about they cannot. It's It's more about like, you can think about like the automobile industry. Mm-hmm. You can say like Tesla, um, it has within, like if you consider the whole chain of pipe and the, the, the supply chain um, for, for, for building a car, you definitely need material. You, ne- you mm-hmm. need designers, you need like uh, people who can like create that network of business and link the factory to the customers. Yeah, you can build an empire that you do everything by yourself, but why you want to do that? So what, what's the motivation for it? If you can have an independent entity whose entire goal is to just focus on the material 
and then you can be completely focused on the design of, of the car, why wouldn't you do that? Because this way you will have a more um, a higher value product at the end of the day. I think this is the same with the quantum industry as well. So the, the, the building the hardware itself is such a complex tax and that itself is an empire that needs its own um, company. And I think it would be, especially at this early age, that um, I would say all of these quantum companies are a startup. Even those big, gigantic mm -hmm. players like Google and IBM, the division that is working on quantum is new. Everything is new. Nothing has been experienced in the past. So, um, and this is such a complex subject. So if one entity is purely focused on building the hardware, and the other one is purely focused on the on the software, I think the quality at the end of the day is going to be much higher. Yeah, I think it's not the matter of the intent. Mm -hmm. So one like counter example is that like, you know, many companies are, and like I'm talking general companies, are going for vertical integration. And they, their argument is that if they keep the whole supply chain and all the elements of the stack in-house, then they have more control over the final product and there's more feedback between different parts of the of the technical stack and it ends up being better product. But I guess it doesn't apply really for quantum computing because we're just at such early stage in the technology that like basically, as you said, like just every single element of the stack is empire in itself. It's not that as in car manufacturing, you have 100 years of tradition, technology development exactly. and everything. It's all new, right? Exactly. Okay. Exactly. okay. Yeah, and another thing is that in this quantum race, the winner is not known yet. And companies mm -hmm. like Zapata are trying to have a like kind of, because they want to like satisfy the frontline customers who are the most important piece, Like right? They want to take advantage of this technology as a whole thing. And... Um, a uh, service provider like Zapata is trying to um, cut the complexity and make the life easier for the frontline customers. So those customers don't want to know like whether Ion Trap is the best one or Superconductor is the best one or like this Adamic or this or that. What they care about is to solve their comp complex computational problem. And they also don't want to go and get a PhD in physics to, to understand how to run a quantum computer. Sure. And that's where the Zapata jumps in and says, look, okay, I'll, I'll, we want to provide a platform that is hardware agnostic. And because the winner is not known, maybe at the end of the day, the, the functional quantum computer is going to be none of these, but a combination of all. Um, so companies like Zapata is making sure that as the industry is evolving, the, the part that is integrating to the existing industry is unchanged. And what, whatever that is happening is on the back end. And Zapata would make sure that as the back end providers are um, evolving and adapting and uh, finding new solutions, Zapata constantly changes this like uh, little steps of integration to make sure that the front line is unchanged. So mm -hmm. I think that's very crucial in our industry. I see. So so you mentioned a couple of actors here or like interested parties. So frontline customers, basically people, companies that will end up using the, the technology, software integrators like Zapata, hardware providers. But looking more broadly at, at the whole quantum computing ecosystem, I'm curious, like, what's your view about what are some other parties involved that make it all work? So definitely there are so many stakeholders that is shaping the ecosystem. Mm -hmm. um, first, well, we definitely have government mm -hmm. because not only as a financial supporter, but also for adapting and adjusting the existing policies. Because as we know that plus, pl policies are the driving force um, in the society and for the in industry is not an exception. So if um, even for trading, for contracting, making regulation, making sure that things are following some basic standards. So government is play, play a crucial role here. Mm -hmm. The second important entity is academic community. Sure. 
Uh, because at the end of the day, these sophisticated technologies are born at universities, right? And um, especially quantum, which is like, um, it's not the complete science. It is still, it, it, it has, um, it started back in 80, as you know, but since then there has been a lot of changes happening and that, that is owed to efforts that the academic community are making. So they're the second important stakeholders. And then we also have incubators, like for mm -hmm. example, CDL in Toronto uh, or uh, Quera. So yes. these companies are trying to make um, quantum awareness is important. It's a new field, new technology. People need to know what it is and what it can offer. And uh, there's also so many resources from the financial, from educational, from the equipment and like, um, so Harvard, Harvard providers they, themselves, they need, they need, they have some supplier as well. So we need people who can like kind of play, um, play the role of a bridge to connect these little pieces together and shape the ecosystem. And the task of incubators is so important there. Sure. Um, yeah. And then the, the last category is the industrial partners where itself can be brought to three different pieces like software provider hardware and also you know, the front line users because right now for quantum the users are not just users they're also a fool of the whole cycle um yes. we, we can see a lot of these uh, potential users who are already contributing in the research part and they're already partnering with this both hardware and software companies to make sure like like an early adopter to make sure that the technology is is in a direction that can um, meet their needs. Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah. And so one, one another player that I, I think you have not mentioned is uh, investors. Oh, yes. Definitely. <laughs> That's but the investors, like mm -hmm. investors, could be any of these uh, stakeholders. Oh, that's true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That definitely. Yeah. Definitely. I think we, <laughs> we've seen a lot of companies that invested in quantum computing startups that are also industry players, and they have established exactly. a business and and so on. Exactly. Okay. I, I think it's not rigorous taxonomy, and uh, we could probably divide all of that into even even more granular entities and we, we can also think about many many others but i wanted to ask you about open source developers and I, I was curious like how do you see this do you see open source contributors organizations that try to you know push open source software for quantum computing as particularly important in, in one way or another or you know just something regular that is happening everywhere in technology and like all the technologies are using open source so it's Nothing special here. Well, I think I'm not the right expert to make comment on that, but um, but I think like having open source is not just in the in the software domain, but in the research domain. Anything mm -hmm. that is publicly accessible, in the long term, is gonna it's gonna serve the humanity. Um, because yes. if if you want to live in an isolated uh, world. And not exchanging information with others, yeah, you may think that you're protecting your IP and you're you are like kind of making sure that uh, you're cutting off your competitors. But at the same time, when you're open to the world, then um, then you you can get feedback and you can get help from all of them. So it's a two way communication, and sometimes uh, the benefit you get is more than the benefit you give people. Because you have a million people helping you, and you're helping one at a time. So uh, for that reason, I'm a supporter of any open source uh, tools, um, software, or anything else. However, depending on the structure of the company and depending on the company's goals and missions and vision and capabilities, sure. some some companies may have to protect their uh, value value um, by not following this open source approach because all they're offering is that software. And if that's revealed, then their treats, their value, their value proposition is lost. 
So mm-hmm. I totally understand that. Like companies like Q Control, for instance, I totally get it. And uh, as I said, it all depends on how the company is positioning themselves within the ecosystem. Uh, but in the long term, in the long term, um, even those companies, when they are um, um, big enough and when the industry is mature enough and when this cycle of revenue is like uh, going on uh, effortless, at that time, I think they can go open as well, like what Google or Microsoft is doing. And also, if you have, there are some capabilities that are not replicable. Mm-hmm. Like you can find Google's codes if you want to, but you don't have their talent, you don't have their structure, you don't have their managing system. So even if you have access to their code, you can be the second Google. So I think that's the way that is a smart business that mm-hmm. at the same time that you're helping the community and they are helping you to grow, you are protecting your competitive position within the industry. Yeah, definitely, definitely makes sense. Okay, so looking at this from maybe uh, yet another angle, so do you think is any of these players currently underappreciated or undervalued, or maybe on the other hand, you know, there is like too much focus in the community um, or public discourse on? one player versus versus another and like by, by player i mean i don't know maybe people are downplaying the role of the government in in all that or maybe they're overestimating certain startups or i don't know do, do you have any, any observations like this well i don't have clear answer to that question but i can answer something else that may mm-hmm. may be implicitly related to what you're you're saying I can tell you what I feel is missing mm-hmm. for for this movement. Um, first of all, like I think there is a kind of mismatch in the pace of growth mm-hmm. between the software and hardware providers. And there's a reason behind that. For the software, as we know today, everything is automated. Everything is, uh, is we have numerous apps out there. And we have so many software engineers and computer scientists that they can quickly develop new uh, platforms, right? Mm -hmm. And also for for the software company in terms of like capital investment that they need to do, because the hardware is not involved, is much cheaper relatively. It's the salary of your people, it's the space, but it's much cheaper. And so... Building a software company, the barrier of entry is lower compared mm-hmm. to the hardware providers. And we, we have so many talent already exist. And if you want to build a quantum algorithm, you don't have to be like a deep physicist. You, you, you need more mathematics and computer science than, than physics. You can, you can hire these talent that exist everywhere and teach them a little bit of quantum and they can be very productive and valuable for the company Mm -hmm. so the talent exists the pool of talent exists and the the capital investment is is relatively lower so therefore i see the software companies are moving in in a faster pace but when it comes to the hardware because this is a special hardware the train the right trained people for that does not exist that much we have physicists who know a little bit of engineer just by experience, by being in the lab at, yes. at their academic institutions. And we have some engineers who are worked, I don't know, in different telecommunication, uh, different industries perhaps, but they, they don't know physics. So now these two need to blend together in order to build the hardware. So I think the pool of talent, the right trained people who can sit there right at the middle between engineering and physics, we don't have many. So there is a lack of talent. And in terms of capital investment, definitely it's an expensive technology and you need the patient investors, Mm -hmm. investors who are not looking for a return within the next five years. And we need a huge investment. Um, For that reason, we have less in, in terms of numbers, 
we have fewer uh, hardware providers and their pace is uh, slower, definitely. Sure. And there, I see a kind of mismatch happening here. Well, definitely approaches like Zapata is taking by hiring people like me is going to help that to, to, to smooth that step. But I'm not sure what are the, um, what's the best approach to make the, to join these two groups together mm-hmm. and blend them together. I wanted to ask about this, this first problem. So like the mismatch between hardware and software, because this is something I definitely see from my experience. So being quantum software engineer, I, I definitely focus way more on, on software and also in helping people learn quantum computing. It's also way easier for me to like introduce people to software. And there are multiple reasons for that. So the first is just software is more available than hardware for pretty obvious reasons. And if, for example, like from the career perspective, if you want to get a job in quantum computing and you don't necessarily want to move across the world, well, if you are working on hardware, you need to work in the lab. If you work on the software, you can work from, you know, more or less any yeah. place in the world. And I think this is also also a big, big problem. But I'm curious whether you have... Um, when it comes to like education and training, and like I, I myself have, have mostly in mind programs like the, the mentor program that we are running at Quantum Open Source Foundation or some other you know initiatives like this, but probably there are, there are other ways to to help people grow. I'm curious whether you think there is something that we should focus more in initiatives like this when it comes to, I don't know, type of projects or the topics of the projects? Because, well, working with algorithms is nice, but it's far from hardware. So people who will learn more about this will be like less trained in what could be relevant if they wanted to get a hardware job, right? right? So maybe it will be good to train them more in something more hardware, hardware related. Mm. And I think... Something that, that you did, you mentored some projects about quantum control. So even though control is, well, still is some kind of software and, and algorithms, it's b- much closer to the hardware and forces you to understand you know, more of what's, what's happening on the hardware side than, like, let's say, yep. QA way. So I'm curious whether you have other ideas, what would be good to focus on in, in projects like this? Or like what people who want to get into quantum computing should be learning in order to be more ready for hardware jobs rather than just like purely software algorithmic ones. So something that I don't quite understand in your question is that who wants to make the change? Are you talking from the people, like individuals who are interested in the hardware and they want to know from their side what they can do for it? Or... You're talking about people who are like creating those initiatives and they're helping the community to move in that direction. So which angle are you talking? I'm oh. mostly talking about the second one, but the first one is also important. So I Okay. <laughs> I was well, something I something that I think is um, should be happening is that Quantum has started emerging from physics department at the universities. Yes. And then instead of like IQC that I grew up, um, it became a multidisciplinary institute, but it's still under the umbrella of physics department. So mm-hmm. at, at IQC, we had people from math, math department, even faculties from computer science, different fields. And uh, we were all at the same institute, but still the majority um, part of that is belong to the physics department. I think quantum, like nanotechnology years ago, does need its own separate entity because mm-hmm. like people who come to people like me who get a physics degree we have to like take special courses that maybe at the if if i'm interested in quantum industry those courses are not directly relevant and it would be more beneficial if i had taken extra courses particularly focus on the hardware building. You know what I mean? So I mm-hmm. think it is needed from the academic side. This is something that I, that I think government would jump in as well to establish new institutions that are 
highly focused on particular area. Even the quantum itself is a very broad range. You can start from the cryptography and quantum communication side, go all the way down to quantum sensing and technologies that are not related to quantum computing. Yes. And then the quantum computing itself, depending on qubit modality, we had different branches. So I think it is big enough to deserve to have its own department and within that department to have different major sub measures that if, okay, I want to get a quantum degree with the specialty in optic, quantum degree specialty in, I don't know, communication or that. And when it mm -hmm. comes to different majors, then the courses are different. So for me, who, who got under the under umbrella of, uh, on, of physics, I have taken courses in cryptography. Mm -hmm. I have taken courses like in optic. I have taken courses in spin physics. But I re if I really wanted to be in quantum industry, I wouldn't take cryptography courses. I'm just saying as an example. But because I was on the roof of a, like a better, bigger mother than mm -hmm. I needed... <laughs> If, even like I had taken, let's say, relativity courses, yes. which is not, which is the, the least important thing if I want to be in quantum industry, right? So for that reason, I'm saying that we need first a separate entity mm -hmm. uh, at universities to train people and give them the, the right degree. And when it comes to initiatives, um, I think we should have like for, for software and uh, we have some camp, boot camp, that people come together within a short period of time, two, three months, and densely they, they get a certification. Why we don't have such a thing for Harvard thing in engineering? I think, um, like, even, so, so some pieces for the Harvard part, even the Harvard part, you don't have to be, like, a, at the PhD level. Mm -hmm. um, Sometimes, not not in everything, but sometimes. Sure. Uh, for example, some people in Harvard company, they might be working on automating the machines. So that's purely um, like software engineering task. Or when it comes to middleware, which is, as you yes. mentioned, quantum control, which is neither hardware nor software. It's not a yes, perfect yes. thing. It's automating things and making things like smart enough to understand like when to pulse, when not to pulse, and what's the optimum way of controlling your heart rate mm -hmm. and electronics. I think these levels, um, you don't need necessarily to have a PhD degree. So I think initiatives like, uh, as you, Unitary Fund that you mentioned, we can have entities similar to that, but it's purely focused on like, uh, um, as I said, developing softwares for controlling hardware, things like that. I think that can happen at the initiative level, not necessarily big, gigantic institutions. But, but yeah, definitely, this is something that people can think about. And I think it's very important because at the moment, we're getting attraction from different fields. I've, I've had people contacting with me who are material scientists, and they want to do fabrication. So if you want to do fabrication for quantum hardware, you definitely don't need to know how the Shor algorithm is working. You definitely don't need to know what is QA or A. Okay. You want to do fabrication for the device. And you, you may not even need to know what is X gate, Z gate. What you need to know is understanding how the nature is working at that microscopic level, right? Mm -hmm. And also the fabrication techniques. I think these people, these are these are the people that quantum industry can attract from existing pool of other industries. But they see such a like kind of big barrier that whoa, this is quantum. I know nothing about quantum. Am I useful? Yeah, absolutely, you are useful. Yeah. <laughs> if you see where you need to sit down. So yeah. we we also need to have like kind of educational thing. Mm -hmm. To let people know how this gigantic network from um, from the fabrication piece to the electronic control to the uh, to the low temperature piece, how these little pieces are together and um, and working together, then people can see, oh, that's the area that I can make a role, uh, that I can make a contribution. Mm -hmm. 
So that's from the individual angle. So I think awareness is, is also another thing that we can work on it as a community. That's a very good, very good point. I think like we as I'm mean, just that's like for, for myself, like looking from the from the algorithm perspective, I I don't think we have good model like as a as a community, like good mental model of how all those parts are, you know, connected and what what are different things in the algorithm that make things work. Like every single person has some idea in their head, but it, it's not like it's when it comes to more general awareness, like like what do you say, which is coming from fabrication to basically applica- like industry application, like the whole range. Application. I think yeah. It's even... Fabrication to a- application. <laughs> <laughs> I see. Oh, oh. I now I see. Yeah, like we should we should probably make, you know, a rap song about this and then like it will all just fall into pieces. Fall into exactly. Pieces. <laughs> I love this. Um, oh, oh yeah. Oh my god, this will be this such a cool project. <laughs> oh. Okay. So the thing I wanted to ask you about is how do you think important it is to give people remote access to hardware so that basically everyone around the world can access hardware computer, hardware computer, come on, like quantum computer uh, via some, some cloud interface. And what, so I see now that, yeah, this is important because this gives people kind of better idea of how hardware works and uh, gives them, like allows them to, to actually play more, like closer to the hardware rather than, you know, just uh, with, with the simulators. But I'm curious whether you think that this is very important thing that basically it would be beneficial for the ecosystem if like all the comp- companies, hardware companies would be giving access to their hardware so that people can work with that, play with that, uh, learn and you know build application around it. Or do you think that actually it's not that important like it's good that ibm is doing that and like ibm gives everyone access to the hardware and like some other companies are following their steps but that that is enough like it's it's not that you know it's makes a huge difference whether all the companies are giving access to to hardware or or not well i think i'm young to answer that question that requires like a little bit of more um people who've been in that field for like 40 years for their entire life <laughs> to make that comment. But um, I can I can tell you my personal opinion. Um, there, are, there are two angles that I can think about. From the company's perspective, um, whether you're a startup that you tried so hard to find an investor or you're a, um, you're a big player like IBM or Google that who have enough money to do so, um, you are putting some money to build that lab from to acquire those talents and to maintain those devices. And as we know, these are really, really sophisticated and expensive devices. For I, rem- I have worked in an NMR lab, and I do remember that every week we needed to feed in nitrogen to just keep the device cool enough. Mm-hmm. And helium is even more expensive than that. So um, it's kind of not fair to a business to to offer such a free service to everyone across the globe and sure. pay the maintenance fee out of their pocket. I mean, even if they are like angels and they want to help the community and the science to grow and the technology to to be built faster, it's just like the there there should be some minimum payment to cover their cost. Not sure. not create a ben- revenue and like profit, but at least cover their cost because, mm-hmm. um, and you know if, even for research, I remember like we had friend, I had few friends that their entire master was just to build a table, and then somebody else take over that project and do the experiment. I mean, building that piece to just start doing science may take a master or a PhD. Mm-hmm. Four years of somebody's life. And if a company is providing that service for free, it's saving four years of your life. And, you know, 
you, you might be a physics that you were interested in doing the experiment, but you you were not lucky. You found a very fresh professor who just started building their lab and you end up like your entire graduate school is just preparing that lab and never do physics with that. So that's not fair because they are they are creating a tremendous value mm-hmm. for those users. And I think those users might pay for that. Be willing mm-hmm. to pay for that. But on the other side, these devices often are crappy. Oh yes. <laughs> so you don't want to you don't want to like I I I watched a video actually a few days ago that somebody was doing a test to benchmark Ion Q device versus IBM in terms of the connectivity. So that person had to Ion Q was charging IBM was was free, had to pay to just see, like, to make a decision which one of these devices I can trust and use for my purposes. And he had to run only one simple example to just look at the diagram, look at their errors to see, to compare them, right? So it's not fair as a customer that they pay in order to find out whether your crappy device is what you promise it is or not. It's like... It's like selling a black box to somebody and saying, like, this is a magic box. But if you want to know that what this magic box can do for you, pay me a billion dollars first. Mm-hmm. So, so they need to know what they're buying. So for that reason, there should be at least, I don't know, even, even a hardware that you're buying for the lab, it has a like kind of um, characteristic uh, um, lab book that you can look and see how this um, this little tool is functioning? Uh, what's the what is it called? Response function of that? I, I forgot the name, but uh, even for electronic component, anything that you buy, it comes with a with a notebook that tells you, okay, we've tested, and these are the testing results. It tells you like these are the area, these are the frequency domain that is functioning very well. This is not, and this is the proof. So then you know, like even though they're manufacturing and they're building those hardware, but it's still there is some, it's nature. You can't guarantee everything 100%, but you know that they've tested and th- this is the test that you have. Such a thing doesn't exist at the moment mm-hmm. for quantum hardware because th- they are building. It's not a product yet to me. It's not, it's a, it's a, you can't say prototype, but it's not a product neither. Um, so, so it's not fair to customers to pay and find out it's how crappy it is. <laughs> so, so I don't know what the solution is. I see. But I think there should be some minimum charge because they are cutting uh, the time for for researcher mm-hmm. three years, four years time, and they are paying for maintaining those devices. But the charging shouldn't be like something that they have a product because they don't. Yet. Sure, sure. So yeah, I think like one model that might be reasonable is something that D Wave did, which is that I think they give you like some like a little bit of time on their devices for free, and it's like I don't remember. It's like really like one second per month or, or something like that. So that like, this is enough to test. Like, if you want to do anything more than just like run some simple tests, then you need to pay for that. So this might well, be- Well, I think but... that's not fair, fair either mm-hmm. because you know, as as we know, research is not gonna happen overnight. Some oh, sure. research ha- takes six months. So you may have to pay six months subscription to find, to just benchmark their device. That's the study you're doing. Once you benchmark and you're confident that the the device is working the way you expected, then you may just start doing the science piece. I mean, uh, definitely whoever that wants to use these devices, they would first characterize it to make sure Mm -hmm. who they're they're dealing with, right? Um, They're not going to like blindly run their ultimate experiment. They have to do some benchmarking first. And I think for that benchmarking period, they shouldn't be charged mm-hmm. that much. So sure. And it's not the second or so. I think it, it takes months. <laughs> I see. I see. Yeah, that's that's yeah. her point. 
that's an interesting, interesting problem. How to, yes. how yeah. to do, do, do things like this. Now I wanted to go back to, to something else you said, uh, before and basically to your role as quantum strategy advisor at the government of Canada. So I wanted to ask, you know, what exactly does it mean to be quantum strategy advisor and how mm -hmm. your work looked like? Mm -hmm. um, it was actually a fantastic experience. Very short, but fantastic. Mm -hmm. There how, were a lovely people. Long? It was supposed to be four months, but because I got that position at Zapata, it ended up with three months. Okay. So it was like an internship. <laughs> at, at government so it wasn't <laughs> anything more than that but it was good enough to me give me exposure mm -hmm. that i've been in academic for for my life and now i know how the life look like at, mm -hmm. at the government and now i choose to be in industry um but it's it's good it's giving me enough experience to see how at, at least people how the language works there Mm -hmm. How the mentality works, what, what's important for them, especially for my current role that is partnership. Yes. It really helps me when it comes to talking to different sectors to kind of have some anticipation that what they're, they need to hear, what matters for them. Okay, going back to your question, my job there, um, um, I was looking at the ecosystem like a bird from the top looking at the town, how these little pieces are connected. I was doing like, basically, um, there were there were certain si certain devices that they need, certain technology that government needed. And I needed to know like, like how these proposals of different um, research in the quantum domain is going to like, at the end of the day, benefit customer, benefit government. That's from the angle of government being the customer, they, they needed to know that which one of these technology would work investment early enough. That was one part of my job. Another part was like, I was looking to see um, these different stakeholders, as I said, incubators, mm -hmm. different governmental department, even governmental department, it was like, it has so many numerous branches from the policy side to defense to um, security to public health service. Um, so these governmental department um, in one category, incubators in the other, foreign um, international partners that we may have, both from the strategic and political uh, bond bonding and also from the technological aspects and also industrial partners. So I've been looking at all of these stakeholders what are the existing relationship between them and how we can shape and engineer mm -hmm. their relationship to move in a direction that we desire, basically. Well, um, to me, it was like another physics problem. <laughs> a physics problem that I have like electrons, nuclear, different particles. First, you need to understand how nature behaves. First, you need to know what's a natural Hamiltonian. What's, once you know how it behaves, then you say, okay, if I interfere with this ecosystem, if mm -hmm. I introduce laser, if I introduce magnetic field, then that interaction is going to move in this direction. The dynamic is going to change. Mm -hmm. So that's the way we actually design um, devices, right? Even from the, <laughs> I, I'm going from one topic to another, but even for like sending the rocket to the moon, you first needed to admit that the gravity exists and then understand how the gravity works, how the planets are uh, sure. moving together. And then once you understood it very well, then you could introduce extra elements to dominate this nature and mm -hmm. send the rocket to the moon, right? It's the same with engineering quantum devices, mm -hmm. like introducing laser and magnetic field. And it was the same with the uh, shaping the ecosystem. It's another complex system. Academic community, they already have some bonding with industries. They, they're getting some investors from there. They have some common project going on. They have international partners um, because like at university, everything is open. 
And in, internally, we have incubators that are connecting these little pieces together. These this is start up with that big, gigantic, and everything going on. So I needed to go through the quantum landscape across Canada, understand mm-hmm. how it's working, and then look at the objective that the department was looking for in the long in the in the three years, five years, ten years, and longer. What are the objective? What are the mission? What are the the best, what's the success look like? Well, we want um, this ecosystem move until we achieve that. So, mm-hmm. and what is missing? What are the gaps? What we've done already and what we need to do, what what we shouldn't have done, what we need to maintain, keep mm-hmm. doing. So that kind of thing. So we needed somebody who do understand the, from the technical side, not necessarily doing the research and producing results, but on, going through projects that are um, offered and, and see how valuable those projects are. What's the technology readiness level mm-hmm. and how extra effort we need to do to make it to that level or we need to forget about it. So that was like kind of... Um, advice. I was the advisor, not the decision maker. Sure, sure. So I was looking the facts, data, trying to analyze them, categorize them, finding the gaps, finding the future direction that it possibly can go mm-hmm. strategically, and providing that info to the higher levels who can make decisions based on those facts. I see. Yeah. Sounds super interesting. It was so fun. I loved it. You know, like three years ago, roughly, when I wanted to switch my career into quantum computing, I did some research about various places in the world. I was still living in Poland and moved with my wife. We still uh, have not decided where we want to move. And I was doing research about various places. And Canada was a very, very bright spot on the quantum computing landscape. One of, I would say, three major hubs that I have identified back then for the things that were interesting for me, obviously. And I'm just curious, why do you think Canada is such an, or like, I hope it still is, but like, has been so far such a strong player in quantum computing? even though it's not, uh, you know, the, the biggest country in the world. Or uh, actually, when it comes to the size, I think it might be, but <laughs> maybe <laughs> no, not I on some Russia other metrics. Is the biggest. Yeah, yeah, that's true, that's true, that's true. <laughs> but, but, you know, like, why, why Canada actually fared so well in the quantum technologies and is considered to be, to be an important player in, in this? Um, what are the reasons? Well, what are the decisions that has been made? That, that allowed this and you know how do you think it it will play out in the future mm-hmm. well um, when I was deciding to uh, find 11 years ago I mm-hmm. was in the same situation as yours that I was looking for a place uh, uh, with quantum labor and Canada was I think it was the top at back then mm-hmm. um, and it was the early um, so I think it was, yeah, IQC was pretty young back then. Um, I think one of the reasons that Canada stand out as a leader mm-hmm. um, is because it recognized the value of quantum early enough and it invested in the research and science, I think, sooner than others. Mm-hmm. IQC, I'm not, I, well, to be honest, I haven't written uh, the history to see who was actually the sure. first, but I'm definitely sure IQC has been among the top five mm-hmm. first institutes that was purely focused on quantum. Mm-hmm. And as you know, d was the first quantum computing uh, company. So I think that was the main reason that Canada stand out because they recognized the value and the potential of quantum computing and quantum technology in general and how that's going to impact our uh, human life in, in, in the future. Mm-hmm. And especially the government of Canada. I, as you know, I have worked also for transformative quantum technologies, which mm-hmm. is 
a, a governmental funded program that tries to make a bonding between universities and industries. Yeah. So Canada recognized that value and is investing from both directions. Uh, from the from the university perspective, is trying not only just quantum computing, quantum technology mm -hmm. in general, in in medical imaging, in um, mining, in different things. That how how we can bring those technological uh, devices to to the existing industry. So they 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 recognize that early enough, and from the industry level also. They are. They've been very supportive. Mm -hmm. um, like company like D Wave just recently got forty million dollars yeah. from the government. So I think that was the big value that uh, Canada has and still has. Um, however, there are some other countries like let's say UK mm -hmm. that they are taking a different angle. So Canada is shaping from the bottom to top, but UK is from top to bottom. Mm -hmm. they, they say, okay, this is the device that we want to have. This is the technology capability that we want to have. Let's see how that connects to university and let's identify those projects that will at the end of the day end up to this particular device and this particular mm -hmm. application. Whereas Canada was like, let's invest in the science because in the long term, it's going to be valuable and lets people freely think about exploring possibilities that what we can do with that science mm -hmm. and um, let them be open minded. And then once they they are mature enough, now it's the time to identify those potentials, ideas that need a little bit of more support to take off and go mm -hmm. to the next scale. So this is the scale Canada is taking. Now, there are some um, pros and cons in both of them. Sure. For the Canada is that you may have this threat that you invest and you have free um, result, like uh, scientific publications, everyone has access to it. And you also train talents. But if you don't provide the, um, like, uh, if, if you don't absorb those talents internally, they're going to go abroad, right? You invest those grad students, you pay them, right? Um, you pay for research, you pay for facility, you publish the results, the science is out there, your competitors, other countries can, can, uh, can have access to it freely, and your talent, you train them, and they go abroad and work for somebody else. So this is a kind of, to me, as a business, it's uh, risky um, because you invest and maybe it benefit others. Mm -hmm. But the, the, the good thing about it is that you create opportunity and you let people to freely grow. And normally, like if you want to be uh, creative and invent something, it's better to be under no pressure. So whereas if you take UK approach, if those uh, faculties, they have to come up with a project that at the end of the day is going to end up with something in the product line, then there is a pressure and your creativity is trapped if you're under too much pressure. That, that's my personal perspective, that there's a pros and cons in, in both approach. And uh, going back to your question, I think Canada did very well at initiating and taking off this quantum. And I think a lot of other countries have been inspired already by mm -hmm. Canada. Uh, but at the moment that this movement is becoming kind of globally, Europe has come in, mm -hmm. US, China, Russia, everyone is, is coming in. If, if Canada wants to uh, safeguard the, the leadership that it has, it's it's better to change the approach a little bit mm -hmm. and be more like technology oriented rather than science oriented. Sure. Um, yeah. Yeah. Very interesting perspective. Thank you. <laughs> so one of the things that I trying to 
mm, okay, asking this question to just like make sure I understand kind of how this how this works. So basically, one of the strengths of Canada was that it started very early, so it it could afford to spend more time for this free search and yeah. you know it was free patient. exploration yeah. because it was patient and it started very early. And in an example that you gave, like UK, well, UK could replicate that, but since it is like 10 years behind Canada in the terms of when it started, then, well, it's like very different competitive landscape between countries and what they want to achieve. Yes. So, well, the, this, this other model suits it better, right? Yeah, yeah. I think the, the strength that Canada has was that it was the pioneer and mm-hmm. it is still the pioneer yeah. in this field. And if you want to keep that position, then I think the approach should change a little bit. I see. I see. Yeah. Okay. So the last question from, from this like uh, government related, I was wondering what's the, because you worked both like in academia, in the industry and at the government and I know what's like the the biggest difference in the mindsets between these three environments. I assume there's like plenty of things that are very different. Yeah. Well, my answer will not be completely neutral. Mm -hmm. My analysis would have a little bit of bias towards my personal preference. Sure thing. (laughs) So, I mean, if you want to have a purely neutral opinion, then uh, you should put aside your personal um, preference, just just to admit that. Well, um, academic, the positive thing is that, um, first of all, you have that freedom of mind, um, that you can explore opinions, different ideas, you can... um, be as creative as you want, as ambitious as you want, and as imaginary as you want. Mm-hmm. Things that does not exist and only exist in, uh, with, with your pen and paper, you can create them. So in terms of the power that you feel, you are the power, of, you are the creator of your science. And, and that kind of has a, has a feeling of satisfactory mm-hmm. that you can do whatever that your mind wants. That, that in that sense, it's similar to art, um, that you create your own world. But what I was missing at the academic was that I initially started the uh, physics with the, with, the, with the attitude of science for science. Mm-hmm. And over years, I think that has changed in academic culture. It used to be like that. I don't know when exactly, but maybe in 19th century. Um, but it has changed a little bit. And I think that's mainly because uh, a large portion of um, if, if academic people wants to survive, it largely depends on whether they can secure a grant or not. Mm-hmm. And if you want to secure a grant, you definitely need to show your research is going to make a change in real life. Mm-hmm. Right. And for that reason, some areas of research they attracted more attention than they should because they found their way of showing relevance to real life, right? And that, that's why they can secure grants easily. And sometimes, um, so, so I've seen between some people that they just look at the problem with the label of, is it publishable? Mm-hmm. So, publication has become the product and if you don't uh, publish or perish i think that's that's the phrase they use um so it has become i think that i don't like that piece of academy and actually that's why i escaped it Mm -hmm. because i want to be scientist and i want to like be as critical as possible and as as possible when you have that pressure that if I don't have two, three publication per year, then you rather choose, you, you purposely choose those projects that first you can get a grant for it. And second is publishable within the next four or five months. So that has become like you need to brand yourself. And the way that you can advertise yourself is the number of the projects that you have. Mm-hmm. And for the professors, 
for the professors, especially young professors, um, what happens is that um, you started with the with the with the motivation and passion for science, but for early years of your career, seventy percent, eighty percent of your life is not research. And also, professors are actually kind of manager, but they're not trained for it. Mm-hmm. So we see a lot of the smart profs. They're super talented, super smart, but they have zero knowledge in management and they don't use the talent of their students or postdocs in the most efficient way. They mm-hmm. actually waste them sometimes. Yeah. So I think this is missing in academic, that if they want to become a faculty, they are ahead of a kind of a startup. They need to learn how to manage the money how to make that relationship with others and network and things like that, and how to take the most um, out of their talent pool. And that is missing. And I have sympathy with them because they are Mm -hmm. trained for research. They are not trained for that. And at the end, they end up with like 70% of their time is is non-science. And that disappointed me to, to move in that direction. However, well, um, they are a great value. And if um, academic research didn't exist, our technology didn't exist. That, that's my personal opinion. For the government, um, government was a great experience that I covered already. Mm-hmm. And something that I didn't like about government teams were very slow. Mm-hmm. <laughs> So being in a startup, especially you, you are trained to do things fast. Yeah, yeah. Fast and productive. Production fast. And but in government, like people were telling me, "Whoa, slow down. That's enough for this week." <laughs> <laughs> I see. I see. So, <laughs> so it was a slow, and it's well. You may think it's not harmful. But sometimes it is when it comes to deep tech, mm-hmm. because deep tech are are emerging so rapidly, and they are evolving so rapidly. And I think the policies policymakers need to adjust with the movement, um, like uh, the the quantum strategy, for example. It may take for the government two years to establish that. Um, strategy, but by then things has changed. Yeah, that's you true. have to update it. <laughs> so I think that that was the missing piece in government, the pace. Mm-hmm. And for industry, I love it. I can't complain about it. <laughs> <laughs> I can't complain about it. But let me find something to complain. Um, I think for industry there are two types. One, you have a corporation. If you're working for a corporation, the culture is established, the mission, mm-hmm. the vision, the tools, the connections, everything is already established. It's not yeah. a try and error. They know what's best for success, right? However, if you are a researcher in a corporation and if you are coming from the academic environment, it might be a little bit hard. Uh, to have flexibility to invent new things and change things, but definitely not not as much as freedom that you have at universities, mm-hmm. right? For a startup, that's something that I love about the startup because if if you ha- you can I can satisfy those um, attitude that I had as a researcher at university to explore unknown mm-hmm. and be as ambitious as you want and shape the future. So these are the things that I can satisfy myself at at a startup, but definitely there is a some level, you pay, you gain, right? You pay something, you gain something. Yeah. Uh, there is some level of a stress at a startup because like at university, if you start a project and it fails, you just fail in a project. Mm-hmm. You st- you're still a faculty there. Nobody is going to kick you out if your project doesn't work. But in a business, in a startup, if things fails, like it's like if it is big enough, then um, 
there is a the price especially if it is a very young startup and the budget is limited mm-hmm. uh, it's a big lose yeah <laughs> it's yeah. not sometimes it may end up with like you don't exist if, mm-hmm. if you don't succeed you don't exist anymore and that that has some some stress into it and also the timeline and competition that you have with others that competition exists in, in universities as well but the level of the project is overall is slower than mm-hmm. startups sure. and uh, so therefore maybe you may feel that you're doing a lot of work with a squeezed limited time maybe that's something I can complain mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. I, I think it boils down very much to, to personal preferences Exactly, and probably like stages in life as well. Like you know, exactly. depending what exactly. what are your goals goals at, at any given point. But speaking yeah. of personal preferences, um, I wanted to ask about your transition from science to more like business and management. I was curious, what was your first serious project where you focused more on the business rather than science? I think what the first experience was Xanadu. Uh-huh. I'm so thankful to Xanadu because he gave, uh, they gave me this opportunity um, because that was the first opportunity. I've never had such experience before, but they saw the potential in me. And they gave me that opportunity. And with that experience, I realized, yes, this is where I want to head. Mm-hmm. Um, and what you were working so, on uh, there? Yeah, there I was... My role was quantum application scientist. I was mm-hmm. a still scientist, but I was like at the edge between the science team at Xanadu and the science team at whoever that uh, would be the potential user. At that time, Xanadu was at the very early stage, so they didn't have Penny Lane mm-hmm. and they didn't have the product yet. But um, this Chris was smart enough to think about the application at the very very early stage of the company Mm -hmm. so um so at that time i was like uh, basically fishing (laughs) Mm -hmm. i was looking into different industries in finance pharmacy um whatever that seemed to have potential for application and i've been like first uh, i was introducing what quantum is about so part mm-hmm. of it was like kind of marketing and bringing awareness and then uh, understanding their the complexity of their problem. So there was some level of learning into it that mm-hmm. was uh, kind of feeding my uh, my spirit as a researcher and curiosity level. So I needed to learn about how the finance system is working. What are the, uh, the typical problems that they have? Similarly for pharmacy. Um, in material development. Uh, and once I learned about them and I knew what Xanadu is doing, I knew what they're doing, and I was trying to see whether with the approach that we're taking, we can offer a solution for them. That was the po- moment I realized like living at the edge is like, I, I can ex- explore universe. <laughs> so mm-hmm. I want to be at the edge. Not inter- internal and not outside, just somewhere at the edge. So, so, so my role at the TQT was similar. Mm-hmm. I was exploring for there. I was the bonding between university and industry, looking for what quantum technology can do in imaging, not computing, but sensing, for example. Yeah. Um, and my role here at Zapata has a similar flavor. Mm-hmm. Here is between software and hardware, but it's still partnership, engagement. Yeah. The two yeah. different entities. Yeah. I'm curious, what are some things that... Because I, I think you can enter this, this kind of roles. Maybe maybe I'm wrong, but from both science background, but also maybe more from like the business background. And I'm curious, you know, what are the things that you think are most helpful for you from like the scientist mindset in, in this type of roles? And what do you think that your past as a scientist actually have not prepared you at all and the skills that you had to learn on the job uh, to actually be, mm-hmm. be effective? Mm-hmm. 
this is hard to answer, but I think if I want to choose between being scientist, then become a manager versus learning, getting degree as, at business or law school and then become somebody like myself, I would choose the first one mm-hmm. because you may learn management skills in business if you have some interpersonal skills and soft skills already i think it is possible i might be selfish though but it is possible to learn business piece within a year or two Mm -hmm. but coming from the other side it's not that easy i have spent like uh including the phd i have spent 10 12 years doing complex stuff calculation, Mm -hmm. simulation, that's not something that you can learn with two years credits somewhere. So I think it's pretty damn hard for somebody who is a manager to learn about physics versus the other way around. And uh, there are some level of management that you implicitly learn as a PhD student. Mm -hmm. As a PhD student, you are the owner of your project. You have to... Uh, acquire some soft skills that you may not be even aware of, that you mm-hmm. do have them. You have to like break your complex problem. You have to break it to little pieces and then try to address them one at a time and try to consider all the possibilities that can happen, for example, and make a prediction. So mm-hmm. your brain has been wired up to become a manager if you put a little bit of knowledge at the top of that. So you do have that um, um, skill already. You you may not have the language and you may not have the technical terminology for that, but your brain does have the functionality of a manager, I think. Okay, so this is not kind of naive thinking, but this is a thought that I came into my mind, which is, okay, you spent 10 years training as a scientist, but you actually don't use most of what you've learned in in the sense that, you know, you're not calculating any integrals at your job right now. So perhaps spending 10 years is, um, you know, it's a little, I mean, not not, 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 to, not a waste, but like it's it's not needed. Though at the same time, well, that's I, I know this this argument is actually not valid because, as you said, it, it's more about wiring your brain and gaining this general awareness, and you just need to go through all the steps and learn all the things that you will never use in your life to actually get that awareness and wiring to to do the job later, right? Well, uh, the way I look at it is that I look at my um, brain muscle mm-hmm. <laughs> when you go to the gym and you do some lifting, right? You want to work on the strength of your arm or the strength of your leg. Those specific movements, you may never do it in real life. Mm-hmm. You may never use such a like kind of lifting like that. How many people in real life are <laughs> like lifting stuff like this up and down? Never That's happens true. almost, right? But why you do so? You're building the strength, and that is strength is helping you in different shape, but you acquire that strength by lifting like that. Mm -hmm. So I see it like that. You may say, I may not do the integral, but this critical mindset that I have today owes to that kind of practice that I've done to shape the muscle of my brain. So that's the way I look at it. So I don't see it as a waste because Mm -hmm. the way the day I was born, I wanted to be a physicist. And if I had never done it, I would have regret my entire life. And I enjoyed, I did physics for enjoying, and I mm-hmm. enjoyed for 30 years. So that's not something that I wasted. Sure. It was like, I lived every second of being a physicist, first. Second, I am still exposed to physics. I am still learning constantly. Mm-hmm. So what was driving me to be a scientist was the curiosity, learning, power of shaping the future, knowing how the universe works, I am doing those stuff still, right? But just in a different form. I'm not lifting up like that, uh-huh. but I am using like strength of my muscles. So um, for that reason, I don't regret a second. I don't regret a second. And 
I think when it comes, when well, as I said, my job is only three weeks, but when it comes to conversation with hardware vendors, I would definitely need my understanding of how the hardware is working. Mm-hmm. I would definitely need that at the negotiation table. So, Sure, sure. Do you use your integrals, by the way? <sighs> I don't do integrals. You don't but either. I, I, I was, but I was actually, there, there was something that I was super surprised that uh, I, I found it useful um, in, my, in my day job. Uh, I don't remember what it was, but like, Admit it. Uh, I know. Admit I know. It. You don't use integrals. No, I absolutely. I don't use integrals. But I, I value. I value like being able to to actually do do integrals. Uh, though actually, I I use plenty of linear algebra. Yeah, I, I have to say that. Okay, so I think we'll be we'll be coming to an end here. Um, last question I have for you is: if people would like to learn more about you and your work, or maybe contact you what's the right place in the internet to find more about you i have a website which is sitting in my laptop and i haven't had the chance to (laughs) make it online (laughs) i see but meanwhile um whoever that is interested to speak with me you can reach me at contact at (laughs) razia.ca so that's great and yeah i'm always open for conversations Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much, Rosier, for the conversation. I really enjoyed it. And have a nice day. Thank you very much for this opportunity. I hope next time I interview you. Looking forward to this. Looking forward. <laughs> okay. Great. Take Bye. care.